Are you cool? Am I cool? Or perhaps the question is, are we cool yet? <laughs> Such a bad joke, dude. I know, I'm sorry, I had to do it. Okay, today we're reacting to Are We Cool Yet by the Exploding Series. It's a group similar to um, Church of the Broken God or The Serpent's Hand. But I don't really know much about it. Um, I don't know what specific attributes and ideals and individuals are part of this group. So this should be um, interesting. So without further ado, let's get into it. Are We Cool Yet? We've looked at a number of anomalies so far through the scope of both science and religion. Anomalies with origins beyond our planet or reality. Anomalies created through foolish accidents or from ancient rituals. What we haven't really looked at, though, are anomalies created through the scope of art. Art is a subjective concept, one heavily divorced from the cold, clinical nature of the SCP Foundation. And so that's why we'll be discussing a group of interest focused on anomalous art. Are we cool yet? Ooh. Like many groups in the SCP universe, AWCY exists as yet another fringe group that meddles with paranormal forces for their own goals. It just so happens that their goals consist of little more than creating really weird art pieces, many of which end up in Foundation custody. As usual, I'll be primarily looking at a handful of these contained exhibits to give us a better idea about the group. But let's see how they operate. Unlike many groups, Are We Cool Yet have no centralized leadership, no headquarters, no strict rules or traditions, and no official lists of members. Really, all it takes to be a part of Are We Cool Yet is to say that you are part of it, and to make anomalous art. Ooh. Anomalous art is exactly what the name implies, and we'll get to some examples in a bit. But not all anomalous artists are part of AWCY. AWCY members tend to make art that is both highly visible to the public and often highly dangerous, leading some to decry the group as art terrorists. A potential origin for the group is outlined in the tale Birth of the Cool. During the 19th century, the realm of science began to slowly understand the paranormal, and certain artists of the world took notice, beginning to create their own paranormal art pieces. By 1870, Paris was the center of anomalous art, and the debate about whether it should even exist. In 1874, the Salon des Magnifiques refused to allow any works of a phantasmagorical nature to be displayed at their grand exhibition. So a group of anomalous artists went off and started their own exhibition, held at the same time. The show was called Somnu Devenu Magnifique, which translates to Have We Become Magnificent? It was the talk of the town for months, and it was clear that this type of art wasn't going anywhere. So it seems like the whole group is just kind of rebel. They're kind of rebel-ish, you know what I mean? People started to understand the what was thought to be un understandable, non-understandable, perhaps is better. And so they rebelled, created anomalous art. Oh, scientists, explain this one. And there's like a tentacle out the, out the picture, you know? Fascinating. I like it. I mean, you just got to create art and claim that you are uh, from ABCY and then you're part of it. I guess it's kind of synonymous with being an artist, you know, calling yourself an artist. Well, there's no organization, there's no structure. You just got to create art. And in the same manner, you can join Are We Cool Yet? I do think, though, honestly, it's pretty fucking hilarious. That somebody got mad at scientists for understanding the world and was like, Bitch, understand this one, huh? Yeah, that's right. Motherfuckers are moving. Explain this one, Mr. Scientist. Right? <laughs> Fuck it, that's, that's, that's funny. That's funny. This paranatural exhibition would be held every 10 years in different hidden locations. And the world of anomalous art would continue to grow. There would be a schism in this world, though, that came to a head at the 1924 exhibition between two anomalous artists. One was a French surrealist, and the other a Mexican artist who embraced the more accessible and realistic side of an art. The two debated for days before the opening of the exhibition about the relation of the artist to their work, the importance of context, of faith, knowledge, law, free will, God, 
the state, and so on. It seems that as the exhibition opened, they had come to understanding one another, Ooh. and a photo was taken of them standing in front of the doors, with one leaning in to whisper into the other's ear. For decades, people speculated what might have been said there, or whether it was a challenge, or an affirmation of their understanding one another, or a reminder of why they were there, or an expression of amazement at how many had come to see their exhibition. According to one reporter who claims that he was close enough to hear, it was all of those, oh. summed up in four words. So it's a little bit like Da Vinci, Michelangelo cool type stuff. Whether that's the actual origin of the movement okay. or just a fun anecdote is up in the air, and really doesn't matter that much. The point is that for decades, members or claimed members of AWCY have been creating art pieces with the goal of shocking, amazing, and changing the world at large. Whether or not they're all art terrorists is up for debate, but I'd say the foundation is perfectly fine with that definition, of and have been cleaning up their messes for years. What do you mean though? The foundation is like, dude, anything that's anomalous. Ah, oh, that's illegal. I don't like it. I don't like it. Dude, it's like, <laughs> I don't know, man. Let's be real. Like the foundation is so like boxed in, you know, it's like, I mean, I see both sides. If you make a lot of like art that kills people, well, guess what? It's gonna be an issue. It, people are gonna have problem with it. Of course. The terrorists. <laughs> Dude, I just picture like SCP Foundation members going into a, like a normal art museum and be like, Look at the terror! It's an abomination! Kill it! <laughs> it's just normal. It's like Mona Lisa hanging on the wall. Kill it, dude! Oh, she's alive. I see her. That's a little bit funny. I can do it. I like these people, man. I like these a lot. Let's look at some of those messes then. At least the ones that could be cleaned up. I've already talked about one of the most popular AWCY creations. SCP-1057, Absence of Shark, in my Aquatic SCPs video. So we'll skip over that one. SCP-1802 is a small robot, about 30 centimeters tall, composed of chicken bones, iron, leather, wire, heavy twine, and a tin can for a head. Oh, he's kind of cute. It is covered in a oh. piece of white canvas resembling a lab coat, oh. and has safety goggles secured on its head using screws. Is it like an SCP Foundation member? The robot there is you? sapient and capable of speech, but is wholly devoted to the single task of collecting any miscellaneous objects it can find and storing them in out of sight places, such as behind a dumpster or at the foot of a tree. Oh, that's kind the of The objects it collects are generally worthless including a bottle cap, acorns, insects, coat buttons, wrappers, or even small creatures such as a gecko. It's noted that the gecko escaped shortly after the robot collected it though. It even managed to remove a road sign using stolen tools, but was not large enough to move it, so it merely buried it in place with leaves. Oh, 1802 was discovered by the Foundation when it attempted to remove a security camera on the exterior of a Foundation facility. In an interview with the robot, it claims that its earliest memory is waking up and seeing a group of people moving around making signs or pouring things. A man in charge of the robot told it that its purpose is to keep anything it finds and to study them so that it can learn. By doing this task, it will become cool. It collects everything it finds because it was told that it doesn't understand much. It was then placed outside and told to keep moving west, collecting things, until it came to a gate with a camera on it. It then tells the Foundation details about the building it came out of, leading the Foundation to raid the place. The last detail it provides is the name it was given, Skip. At the building, the Foundation only found a cardboard box with a note attached, reading, Found this for you, appreciate the gestures, and special procedures, figure it out. Dude, that is like the cutest little thing, dude. So its whole task is just to go around and collect items and learn about this world? That is actually kind of cool, I'm not gonna lie. That is, I like this. I like this a lot. Inside the box was a white bottle cap which the Foundation collected and labeled as an SCP. Basically, this whole thing was just an Are We Cool Yet member making fun of the SCP Foundation and what they do. Skip, ah. the robot, 
named after the phonetic pronunciation of an SCP, collects things in the world that it doesn't understand, and stores them away from prying eyes. Sometimes things escape, such as lizards, and other times the Foundation contains things on the spot because they can't move them for whatever reason, like the road sign. Yeah, so it's like a Foundation As the final joke, they left the white bottle cap, implying that it's an anomaly, and the Foundation scooped it up and stored it away, just like Skip would. In uncommon fashion, then, no one ended up getting hurt from this AWCY piece. On the other hand, we have something like SCP-1590, an application designed for touchscreen devices called the Book of Tamlin. Upon booting up, the application displays a welcome message saying, To Joey, who taught me how to be cool, and the name of the last person who played the game, who almost made it out. The Book of Tamlin is a game consisting of a series of images of different rooms, and the player is given subsequent tasks to complete in each room, all of which consist of locating different objects in the room. Basically, it's a really messed up version of those cool I Spy books. Oh, like Fine Waldo. The game consists of anywhere between 7 and 43 rooms, and the player also has a time limit between 1 and 12 minutes. The images and tasks are all personally relative to the player, beginning somewhat benign before becoming increasingly personal what and are these traumatic. Pictures? There isn't really any winning of the game though, as at either a random point during the game, or when the timer runs out, the screen displays the text, you found out everything there is to find about the house, now all you have left to find is the way out. The game then ends, and can't be replayed by the same person. Within 72 hours of this point, a door the player opens in real life will open instead to a room from the game they played, and eventually every door the player opens will open into the game, practically forcing them in. After they go through, all contact will be lost with the individual. As That's some freaky. examples of the games played by individuals, one D-class player saw a farm owned by his uncle, where his parents sent all of his pets, with the task of finding the graves of all seven of his childhood pets. Another image for the same D-class was a locker room from his middle school, where he was involved in multiple altercations with the task of finding the 13 boys who made his childhood a living hell. After finishing the game, the D-class opened a door that revealed the same locker room, at which point he charged through. An agent for the Foundation played the game, seeing an image of his time on deployment in Korea. The task is to find the buddies he left behind. The door he opened in real life opened to the same scene, and he willingly entered with survival gear. Not all participants have entered willingly, as one female D-Class was sedated and forced through to confront her childhood trauma. Wait, so wait, is it all like childhood trauma oriented? Man, it's like you were sent into a maze of your own, should we say, misery. Yeah, sounds too horrible, too hard, maybe too hard. But in a sense to deal with some of the uh, personal hell, if you will. But since nobody has returned or found a way out, what does that imply? Can you just imagine though, being forced to do one of these things, man? And then you, you, you're not going in because you know you don't come back, right? And then they, then they sedate you and throw you in. What the fuck is that, dude? I suppose you can never live in a house, though. But if you choose not to live in a house, you can never, you will never enter the room, right? So essentially, the maze makes you a permanent hobo until you complete it and find a way out, which no one does. I do wonder if the game continues when you're inside, but it's more, um, more realistic. In the end. Once you play through, unless you can avoid opening doors for the rest of your life, you're going to have to go through. From most points of view, it seems more like cruel torture than a piece of art, but I guess maybe I'm not cool. Art is often created to change how people think about things, and that leads us to SCP-1127, which takes that concept pretty literally. 1127 are a series of anomalous short films, primarily composed of scenes taken from other films and videos, 
Hmm. A narrator has also been added to each film, providing commentary and occasionally interacting with objects and characters from the original footage. Anomalous effects occur after an individual watches one of these films for at least 20 minutes, resulting in a permanent change to their normal behavior. One film, titled Were Clowns Always Yellow, takes footage from The Sound of Music, The Night Porter, The Day the Clown Cried, Surf Nazis Must Die, and archival footage from World War II. The narrator, a man wearing a Nazi uniform with his face obscured by clown makeup, comments that when our lives become the joke, humor becomes a war crime. The punchline is always death, and to get it is to abandon the pretense that getting it matters. Laugh at the reality that is laughing at you. At this point, the narrator produces a pistol and shoots actor Jerry Lewis in the back of the head. After watching the film, viewers will consider it to be the funniest thing they've ever seen, but will express disturbance and disgust at any normally humorous communication. Most jokes will be seen as offensive, but material that is normally offensive or distressing will be seen as amusing. Hmm. Another film, titled Crazy Where You Are, combines footage from Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, Faces of Death, various animated short films featuring Bugs Bunny and Tom and Jerry, Ooh, and a Three Tom Stooges Jerry short. Part. The narrator is a female child around 12 years old, wearing a blue dress and a black domino mask. Throughout the film, she slowly dismembers a teddy bear with a small knife, and asks questions such as, are you afraid of violence, and whether violence is the answer or the question. After watching the film, viewers will generally express no strong emotional response to it, and will also lose interest and emotional connections to things, activities, and people. They will also fail to react to dangerous and hostile environments, and will start to injure others merely out of curiosity. Or they make them psychopaths? Another film is especially dangerous, as viewing it is liable to make viewers compulsively perform illegal and perverse activities. Oh, what? Like, touch people? Since these films are popping up randomly around the internet, in video stores, and in theaters, you can see how AWCY gets pretty easily labeled as terrorists. Fair. Speaking of compelling people to do things just for the sake of being cool, there's another app, SCP-1883. This one's pretty simple, as the app just displays a user's score, and every five to nine hours updates with a new task that they can perform to earn points. It's not really clear how the app can tell when a user has completed a task, but there is a mild compulsive effect that encourages players to continue performing tasks. This effect increases when numerous players gather together to compete, and they begin to follow informal hierarchies based on each other's scores. Mm. If a task involves communication with another person, the app will somehow spread to that person's phone, making the app fairly dangerous, as of course the tasks become pretty worrisome. Looking at a sample list of tasks provided, it starts out fairly basic, awarding one point for saluting the sun, and seven points for finding a horse and watching it for 30 minutes. Three points for banging your head against a wall, and 10 points for telling a stranger what you really think about them. If you manage to turn gold into lead, you get 999 points, which is pretty cool. The instructions sometimes include text that isn't a task, such as, if Babe Ruth was that great, why did he need a bat? What? To earn 150 points, you must rob a bank, but only take quarters. For only half a point, you can convince another person that you are dead, and if you kick a yellow dog, you get no points, which you would think no one would do, but you'd be surprised, I'm sure. What? Why would somebody do that? Why would you yeet a golden retriever dude, just because, and you get zero points? That is so dumb. That is so fucking dumb. Just as like a side note, I really enjoyed the little movies that made you change behavior, although you know, not exactly good SCPs in terms of uh, its effect on society, of course. There's, a, there's something I don't understand with the app. 
Which is, what is it that you get from doing it? Yes, you get a score, yes, you get points, but what does it do? I know, I know that it like gives you some, like it was like talking about some hierarchy or you get some like creds. I feel, can't you just stop? As soon as it, it, it tells you to do something bad, right? Like strangle a chicken. Then you're like, nah, this ain't for me and you delete, right? Can't you do that? It seems like such a, such a better way to deal with it than to do, you know, like you go through it, you know? I don't know, I find it strange. 200 points to eat something that has been in a grave and 90 points to walk on glass and describe the noise it makes. Sometimes you might have to ignore a task to get 21 points, which is probably trickier than it seems. And if you gain five points, you get five points. If you burn an irreplaceable object and manage to replace it, that's worth 100 points. But it's only 15 points if you love someone. Sometimes breathing might actually cost you 200 points. And a couple tasks are apparently so horrific that the foundation expunged them worth 300 and 450 points. That was probably solved. The text the after shit. those two says, the real skeleton was inside you all along. Are we cool yet? The foundation heard about the app after an incident in which at least 72 people irreparably wounded their left eyes with household objects, most of which were using the app, meaning that some did it just for the fun of it. Bro, people are too bored, man. Stendhal syndrome is a supposed psychosomatic condition that involves people suffering from heart palpitations, fainting, and even hallucinations after viewing art of incredible beauty. Members of AWCY would of course be interested in this phenomenon, bringing us to SCP-1074, an oil painting on canvas that, when photographed, just looks completely gray. When viewed directly, though, Viewers suffer from symptoms similar to Stendhal syndrome, and will attempt to vividly describe the painting they are seeing to any nearby. Bro, what is these pictures, man? Look at them. What the fuck is that? Oh, bro. Dude, these things, man, that they take in the pictures he used, they're so fucking... Oh, God, I hate them. I hate them. Look at it. I hate it. Kill it. What is this? Oh, God. It's still there. Dude, it's so bad. It's so bad. What the fuck? No two viewers have described it as the same artwork, but they all agree that it is the most beautiful and moving piece of art they have ever seen. They will not turn their heads from it unless forced, and will attempt to convince everyone else nearby to view it as well. They will also begin to discuss philosophical questions related to the painting, bringing up human mortality, individual insignificance, legal or moral judgment, and religious eschatology. Within three to five minutes of exposure, the individual will become permanently catatonic, but will continue to display brain activity as if they were fully awake and aware. If forcibly removed before this point, they will stave off catatonia for some time, continuing to describe every detail of the painting and report even seeing it in their dreams. Typically within five to eight days though, they will slip into the same coma unless treated with amnestics to wipe their memories. Even then though, the foundation has yet to find a way to permanently prevent it, and the longest someone has gone is six weeks before going catatonic. Hmm. In an interview with the D-Class who was exposed to the painting, he describes it with confusion as it seems to be a painting of himself on his knees, crying. There are flames all around him, and he surmises that he's in hell, along with Jesus Christ. Jesus is scowling at the D-Class, and he is holding a flaming sword, as well as a scale with a heart on one side and an apple on the other. The apple is depicted as heavier, and the man interprets this to mean that Jesus is judging him, and he is guilty. Although he had vehemently denied in court the crime of murdering his wife and child, oh, he now admits to it and says that, of course, Jesus knows, and it all makes sense now. Dude, I would so look at that picture. I wouldn't even hesitate, dude. I don't care if I gotta be a vegetable for the rest of my life, dude. I don't care. 
Imagine the most beautiful art that you will ever see. The most meaningful representation of aspects that you value the most represented for you. That would be amazing. Even if it was horrifying, you know, like it was for the uh, D class member. But dude, sometimes I forget that, that D class members are criminals. I don't know why. I just, sometimes I just completely forget that they are like absolutely like rapists and murderers and terrible people. He says that he is nothing and everything. Everything is nothing and that everything is imaginary. We have to exist though, and we must will ourselves into existence in order to vanquish the dreamer that dreams of our existence. After going silent for some time, the D-Class says that he has one question. Are we cool yet? That's a question we'll likely never have a definitive answer to. AWCY is a disjointed, confusing mess of an organization, just the way they prefer it. There's no real goals or endgame for me to discuss here. It's all simply art, and art can't always be readily explained. There is a lengthy series of tales regarding AWCY called The Cool War, which I didn't touch upon at all in this video, so we'll have to save that for another time as it provides a more specific look at members of the group. The Cool War, huh? AWCY cool. aren't the most popular group of interest, as they often come across as pretentious and insufferable. And they are a far cry from the unknowable Lovecraftian roots of the SCP universe. Love them or hate them, though, you can't deny the efforts they go through just to be cool. I was told last time that the Exploring series actually have like pretty good endings that I should read. Um, so let's read it today. Stop making things because you can. Stop making things because you want to make things like everyone else. Stop making things because you already saw the same thing and want to do it again. Stop making things that aren't yours. Stop making things that aren't cool. You want to know why we aren't cool yet? It's because we includes all of us. And sadly, you are one of us. And you just aren't cool. Well, that's puzzling, dude. Huh, that's pretty, it's pretty interesting. That was quite a lot of SCPs they mentioned. Some really, really cool one. I gotta be honest, dude, Skippy, the robot with the, um, the robot that was a parody of the SCP Foundation. Oh, I love that little one. That was so, I don't know why. It was so cute. It reminded me of, um, oh, do you remember that little, what is it called? That little light bulb? That was in like, wait, what is that in English? The three ducklings, dude. What is that called in English? What is that called, dude? Ola Doffen Engelsk. Huey Dewey Louie. What? There's no fucking shot, dude. There's no shot. Huey Dewey Louie? Get a fuck out. Is that what you call it? Okay, I don't know what they're called, but at least I'll find a picture of it. And it was like this little robot with like, um, the head was like a light bulb, dude. It reminded me of that one. Did you get an answer for the question? Are you cool? Hmm? Have you become cool now that you've understood? <laughs> so I need to stop. Pretty good video. I generally, I loved it. If I were to pick a group to be a part of, it's like on an equal footing with the library people. I gotta be honest, it's like on equal footing. The problem is like the library people, uh, the Serpent's Hand. I, th I believe that was the Serpent's Hand. They were very like, oh, let me educate you about this so you don't like fucking right? And are we cool yet? Are like, I don't know, they're like so rebel, but I love it. What did you guys think about it? Did you guys enjoy? Was it something that, was this video something that you enjoyed? Did you like it? Thank you guys for watching. Please have a like, subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next one. What is that called? Fuck, I don't remember.